Welcome back to the second part of our series on Texas kolaches. In part one, we talked about how kolaches got to Texas in the first place. Now, I think today is the best part of our series because we're actually going to be making kolaches. And since they are a Czech specialty, it only makes sense that we make them here in our Czech kitchen. You might remember that the 1930s is a really difficult time in the United States. It's the Great Depression. A lot of people are out of work. In cities, you see lines for bread stretching all the way down city blocks. And if you do have a job, then you have to be really careful with your money. And a lot of things you can't buy in the store if you go looking for them. So people need to be really creative when it comes to baking. But if you live on a farm, like a lot of Czech Texans did, you might be a little luckier. You might have your own chickens, you can get eggs, and your own cow to have fresh milk. But what you probably don't have is electricity, and you probably don't have running water either. So you have to start your day by getting up early in the morning, lighting the wood stove so you have heat in your house, walking outside, getting eggs, getting milk, going down to the well to get water, bringing that back. And then once you get back in, then you can start baking. We're going to make Folklife Festival kolaches from the ITC's very own cookbook, The Melting Pot. Now, since I have just about no experience with kolaches, I thought I should talk to someone who does. Jerry Janeczka, ITC docent, Czech Texan, and kolache expert. I figured we should start with some basic questions. Is this a kolache? That's not a kolache. Klobosnice. Klobosnice. That's a pig in a blanket. The kolache is a piece of pastry with fruit in it. Okay, got it. I'll definitely be making a fruit filling. What do you think I should serve with these kolaches? Make chicken noodle soup, and then probably we have sausage. Then after, after that would be, we have some kolaches, you know, and coffee and, and that. Chicken soup and coffee might be a little ambitious for my first time. We'll stick with just the kolaches. But how will I know if I made them properly? When you, when you pick up a kolach, it's soft. When you pick it up like this, the fingers will go right into the, the dough. Okay, the dough is important. Let's hope I get that right. So to make the dough, you have your basic dough ingredients, flour, milk, sugar, eggs, and you just mix that all together. And once you get all your ingredients in your bowl, then you mix and mix and mix and knead and knead and knead until your dough is done. And then you just let it sit for a while. Now we can decide what kind of filling we're going to make. But first, let's think about what was available to a Czech Texan cook in the 1930s. If we want to make a fruit filling, what kind of fruit can we even find? A lot, actually. Preserved fruits and vegetables were really popular during the Great Depression because they provided really important nutrients and you could keep them for a really long time. So in this kitchen, we would probably find dried fruits like prunes and apricots and canned fruits like pineapple. And if you were lucky enough to live on your own land where you had a garden or fruit trees, you could can your own. And a lot of people did, including the Czech Texans who cooked in this kitchen. Canning is a pretty simple process. You take fresh fruits or vegetables, put them in a jar, add a preservative, such as sugar or salt, and then place that jar in a pot full of boiling water. This seals the jar, which keeps the food inside safe and edible for a year or more. In this kitchen, we have peaches, beets, green beans, and of course we have sauerkraut, which is a Czech staple. Now, this is a special occasion, so let's be indulgent and go with pineapple. Making the filling is great. It was much easier than the dough. The hardest part was really getting the can open. But once we did that, we added pineapple with flour, sugar, and melted butter and cooked it over a stove for a little while. And then we got our dough, made little kolaches, put them on our baking sheet and put a little hole in the middle. Oh, there's butter. We had to brush them with butter first. And then we pushed it down a little bit so it makes a hole for the filling. And then you just add it on with your spoon, sprinkle it with wasipka, which is flour and sugar, and put that in an oven for about 15 minutes. Well, these turned out a little overdone, but I didn't want to thank Jerry with a burnt kolach, so I went to a local bakery to let the professionals handle it. At first, we weren't sure if he enjoyed it, but he didn't stop eating it. So maybe the best lesson that I learned is that even when a kolache isn't perfect, it's still pretty good.